what is the number one thing we're all looking forward to? The return of Jesus. And that's gonna be amazing. The most exciting event that can ever happen. Everything is going to be made new. We're looking forward to his return. But before Jesus returns, the Bible says that first, a leader will arise. Many of us refer to him as the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. And it says that this leader is going to be against God and will even try to persecute those who are on God's side. So we have a very important question that we have to ask ourselves. And we have a very important thing we have to talk about. Because if this leader arises at some point in our lifetime, if we happen to be here for it, what do we do? What is the Christian response? Are believers allowed to resist him or even fight against his forces? I think this is something that we have to talk about. And that's why today we are exploring what the Bible says about that. And we will examine the spirit of Elijah. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. So the Bible says that the Antichrist will arise and will try to persecute those who are on God's side. So what should be our response if this happens in our lifetime? Well, if you haven't seen the Two Witnesses movie part two, definitely check that out uh, because uh, I mentioned a few things and I mentioned how I wrestled with this very topic of how we should respond to the rising of this leader who the Bible says will come. Because when I think about it, you know, the Bible says this leader is going to persecute, um, even purge those who aren't on his side. When I think about it, usually what comes to mind are the images that you probably as well have seen through various end time movies. Maybe you've read from various end time novels. And there's this image of the Antichrist. He comes onto the scene and then he basically just starts to persecute those who are on God's side and he rounds them up and puts them in prison and there's no fight, there's no resistance. And so I, for the longest time, just assumed that whenever this happens, if I happen to be around here for it, then I guess, well, we'll just go quietly and just uh, not put up any fight and just say, hey, well, I guess this is the end. This is it. But now that we are studying this on a deeper level, and as a person who has a wife, who has kids, people that I care about deeply, eventually the thought of this possibly happening in my lifetime, I mean, it starts to weigh on you. I'm sure it starts, it's, for many of you, this is weighing on you as well because you have, a, you have a family, you have loved ones, and the idea of this possibly happening in your lifetime, it has to concern you if you believe what the Bible says about it is literal and true. So I begin to think about this, okay? I begin to think about the scenario, how this could play out and, and how I would respond to it. And I begin to think about if I, if I was home, okay? If I was at home and my family's there and if even a robber came to my home and tried to hurt my family, look, even as a believer, as a Christian man, if anyone comes to my home and tries to hurt me, tries to hurt my family, the first instinct really as just a protector is to stop whoever it is from harming them. And I'm sure many of you would do the same. Whatever you have to do to defend your loved ones against someone who would come into your home and try to do anything to them, I think you would do not even thinking about yourself, but just thinking about how you can protect and defend them, right? You would do whatever you could do. You would risk your own life to take that person down if someone came to your home and tried to hurt them, a robber, no matter who it is. You wouldn't just say, well, I'm a Christian, so I guess since we, you know, we're peaceful people, you know, we don't like to ruffle feathers, so I guess they can just come in here and take whatever they want. They can hurt me, hurt my families. I mean, at least if we die, we will see Jesus, so we're not going to fight. No, what would we do? We would defend our family because we know there's a responsibility with that. So I begin to wrestle with this whole scenario of the Antichrist rising, trying to persecute believers, as the Bible says will happen, because 
honestly, I had to ask myself, if I would defend my family against a thief, a robber, someone trying to break in and hurt them, if I know that as a loving person, I would responsibly defend them against a robber, how much more would we fight the Antichrist if he tried to come in, right? Because we know he just wants to, you know, persecute. So I think most of us, when you look at it like that, you would you could easily come to the conclusion that, yeah, if you were in a position where the Antichrist tried to come and attack you or your family, you would defend them by any means necessary. I think we can come to that understanding, that agreement. And that sounds reasonable. I think it makes sense. But at the end of the day, we don't want to just use logic. We don't want to just use reason. We want to know what the Bible says. How does the Bible say the people of God or the, or the saints will respond to the Antichrist? That's really what we need to look at here as our marching orders, right? So I think a good place to start would be Revelation uh, chapter 11, because that deals with really the two witnesses. And Revelation chapter 11 just shows that when the Antichrist arises and comes into the world, he's not going to have it easy because Revelation chapter 11 talks about how the two witnesses will go to war with the Antichrist. You know, they will cause plagues to come, fire will fall. And look at how it reads here in Revelation 11, 7. It says, and when they, the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast, which is the Antichrist, that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and will conquer them and kill them. And so this is something that we talked about in the recent Two Witnesses movie part two. We looked at how the two witnesses will have so much power. They will be doing miraculous things phenomenal things as they are witnessing to the world, they will have so much power that the Antichrist will have to war against them. He will have to, they will be a force to be conquered. He will have to conquer them. And so there's going to be this battle between the witnesses of God and the Antichrist. And again, I want to focus on these two key words here. It says that the Antichrist will go to war with them and he's going to have to conquer them. They're going to be a force to be conquered, war and conquer. So I think we got it. When the Antichrist comes, the witnesses are going to be fighting him. So what about the saints, the believers? Where do, where do the believers fit into this? Now, most of you already know kind of where I lean with the two witnesses. Um, but if you're new to this channel, uh, I just want to say you still may be wondering, OK, so we know the witnesses will fight against the Antichrist. But what about all, what about belie believers? Are we going to fight, too? What's, what's going to happen? <laughs> well, let's look at Revelation 13. Uh, verses six through seven it's talking about here how when the antichrist rises to power it says that he will utter blasphemies against god he will blaspheme the name of god and his dwelling and those who dwell in heaven and then revelation 13 7 says that the antichrist will also make war on the saints and conquer them that's interesting remember those two key words we looked at he will make war on the witnesses and he will conquer them. Here it says that he will make war with the saints and conquer them. Interesting. Just as there's a war with the Antichrist and the witnesses and a conquering, here it describes a war between the Antichrist and the saints. So the saints will be a force to be conquered. Interesting. The point is, I want to make here is this clearly it says there's going to be a war between the antichrist and the saints anytime there's a war there is a conflict you have two sides fighting against each other you know when the nazis persecuted the jewish people in concentration camps that wasn't called a war that was called really an extermination and i think that we have always had this idea of the Antichrist arising and then persecuting the believers in the same way that Hitler persecuted people in concentration camps. But the, the Bible doesn't really describe it like that. The Bible says the Antichrist will war against the witnesses. He will make war against the saints. So it sounds like the saints 
will fight against him. So really, I think a better illustration of the time period of the Antichrist is not Hitler and concentration camps, but really two sides fighting in war. And one thing we looked at in the recent uh, documentary is what the book of Daniel said about this. In chapter seven of Daniel, he was having a vision of the Antichrist. And it says in verse 21, I kept looking and that horn, the Antichrist, was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time came when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Wow. So here, Daniel also sees a vision of the Antichrist. But he doesn't describe that as him exterminating the saints. But Daniel sees a war that is being waged between the Antichrist and the saints. And then it says here that he was overpowering them until God came when Jesus returns. And then the saints finally took possession of the kingdom, which we know will happen when Jesus comes and sets up the kingdom here. So it's just interesting. Because John in Revelation and Daniel both have visions of the people of God fighting or going to war with the Antichrist. And Daniel describes this war as something that is not just over in a second, but he describes it as really an ongoing conflict. They were being overpowered by this Antichrist figure. So there's a there's a conflict here. You can see why many are starting to see a link between how when it describes the Antichrist, going to war with the witnesses, how, you know, it's likely also a way of describing the battle between the Antichrist and the saints, the people of God. Just as the Antichrist is said to fight against the witnesses, it says he is going to fight in war against the saints. And this is likely why in Daniel 12, 7, the angel tells Daniel that the war will last for three and a half years. You know, he says, basically, this conflict between the Antichrist and the people of God, he says, it will be for three and a half years. He says here, when the power of the people, of the holy people, has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. So, as we looked at before, the people of God will be empowered in some way. And for three and a half years, they will be in this conflict with the Antichrist. It's interesting here that it says for three and a half years because we know that in chapter 11, the time period that the witnesses will be fighting against the Antichrist will be for what? Three and a half years. And so we see more evidence of this conflict and of the power of God's holy people, the saints, believers, um, in Daniel eleven thirty two, when it describes how the Antichrist will arrive and he will be corrupting people, but the people of God will be powerful. Look what it says here. It says that he, the Antichrist, will act wickedly against the covenant. He will corrupt people by flatteries, but the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. I mean, it's just amazing. The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to try to corrupt people. Um, but those who know God will be made strong and will do exploits. Sounds pretty powerful to me. Uh, the ESV interprets it as, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Okay, that doesn't, doesn't sound like concentration camp victims. That sounds like people who are going, who are going to fight. Uh, the NASB interprets it as, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. The New King James Version interprets it as, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So these translations interpret the Hebrew words as the people of God who know God are, are not going to be weak. They're going to be strong and they're going to be doing powerful, amazing things. You see, when the Antichrist arises, if it happens in our lifetime, we just got to erase everything we've seen about believers cowering in fear. 
We just got to get that out of our head at this point. OK, it's time to stand up and spread the word. You will not see believers cowering in fear like we see in the end time movies. You will not see believers hiding out and camping out out of starvation. No, what you will see is a fight. You will see a force. My friend, you will see a resistance. And so the question of if believers can fight the Antichrist, <laughs> well, I think the scriptures make it clear. It's impossible to have a war without a fight. It's impossible to resist without a resistance. And so I believe that it is safe to say that if the Antichrist tried to enter your home, you have permission to firmly resist him and fight back. Let not my enemies try and pull me. And so if the saints, the witnesses are empowered to fight the Antichrist and do great feats before Christ returns, what would that power look like? To what can we compare it to? Well, now it's time to discuss the spirit of Elijah. Around 870 BC, in the book of 1st and 2nd Kings, we hear about the prophet Elijah. And this was no ordinary prophet. The power of God rested upon him. When the kings of Israel disobeyed God, Elijah would come onto the scene and whip them into shape. When King Ahab committed idolatry, Elijah was given power to stop the rain and cause drought. Elijah was also given power to heal there was once a woman whose son had died and Elijah prayed over the child and the child came back to life. At one point, Elijah was sitting on a hill and uh, 50 troops came to him. Elijah caught down fire from the sky and burned them all up. And then another group of 50 came to him. He called down fire from the sky again and burned them up. Elijah had an interesting type of anointing. This is why many refer to him as a warrior prophet. Some prophets just deliver a message. Elijah, on the other hand, delivered a message as well as the wrath of God. Now, why is this significant? Well, the book of Revelation says that the witnesses of God will call down fire from heaven in the end times. And it says the witnesses will stop the rain. And so many theologians argue that the same type of prophetic anointing and power that was on Elijah seems to be the same type of prophetic anointing that will be upon the witnesses. You see, anointings can be transferred. Okay, let's look at something. So. Elijah was a prophet of God who had an extreme anointing of power. Now, Elijah had a devoted follower named Elisha. OK, and in second Kings, Elijah and Elisha were walking along a road. And as they were walking, Elijah turned to Elisha and told him that the time for him to go to heaven had come. And, Eli and Elisha was devastated. You know, he loved Elijah. He didn't want Elijah to leave. And Elijah basically let him know that he wasn't about to die, but God was going to come and take him into heaven while he was alive. Like, we, this is not something that normally happens. And so before Elijah was taken to heaven, he took off his coat, his mantle, and he struck the water with it. When he struck the water... <laughs> It parted from one side to the other. 
And then both Elijah and Elisha walked to the other side of the land. I'll never be able to do what you do. You will, Elisha. And after that, Elijah turned to Elisha, lets him know that he's about to go to heaven. And before he goes to heaven, he says, Elisha, I'm going to give you one final request to ask of me before I go. And so look at how the conversation goes in Second uh, Kings 2, 9. Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And so here in this moment is Elisha's big chance to ask for anything from prophet Elijah before he goes to heaven. Like whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Just ask. So let's see what Elisha asks for. <laughs> and so Elisha says, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Wow. Elisha could have asked for anything, but he says, Elijah, whatever is on you, whatever type of anointing is on you, please let me have it and a double portion of it because I want that type of power. He makes this request, right? He wants a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And after he makes that request, then out of nowhere, just a chariot of fire comes. A whirlwind picks Elijah up and he's carried to heaven. And you can just picture Elisha looking up like, well, I guess that's it. My master's, my friend is gone. My master's gone. But as Elisha's looking up, he notices that Elijah left something behind. You see, as Elijah was ascending to heaven, he left behind his coat. <laughs> so Elisha picks up the coat. Now, remember, Elisha has no power, right? He's a follower of Elijah, but he has no power. He's not really known as a powerful person at this point. But he sees that Elijah left behind this coat, this mantle. So Elisha, he picks it up. And when he picks it up, he it's like he's thinking, OK, let me just try something here. Because remember, Elijah had hit the water with the coat and then the water parted from one side to the other. And they walked both walked through. So Elisha grabs the coat and it's like he's saying, OK, let me let me try something here. So Elisha then hits the water with the coat. And just as Elijah did, the water parted and everybody saw it. Jaws dropped. And when people saw this, this is what they said in Second Kings 2.15. The spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. Elijah left behind his coat. And when Elisha got the coat, his mantle, he was clothed in the spirit of Elijah. Now, <laughs> this is this is pretty cool. So Elijah goes to heaven. He leaves behind his coat. Elisha picks it up. Now he has the spirit of Elijah. But remember, the spirit of Elijah is not just any type of anointing. No, the spirit of Elijah is a warrior for God anointing. OK, <laughs> so if you get if you have that type of anointing that comes upon you, mm, that's that's kind of a big thing. So let's look at what Elisha did after he was clothed with this type of anointing. So. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, shortly after Elisha received this empowerment, he immediately just started operating in the gift of healing. Verse 22 says that um, Elisha spoke to the land and he spoke to the water and um, he healed it so that it became fruitful. So he immediately had some type of power with that. And then as he continued to walk along this road, um, something interesting happened as he was walking. Uh, take a look at this, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. So from there, Elisha went up to Bethel. And as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. They said, get out of here, Baldy. Get out of here, Baldy. And then he turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. 
Um, let's look at this. Let's kind of talk about this here. Okay, so Elijah, he's walking on this road. Some boys come out of this town. I guess they don't like bald guys. Hey, they're making fun of him because he has a bald head. Okay, and they said, "Get out of here, Baldy." He didn't like that. He knows that he has the spirit of Elijah on him. He calls a curse on him. Two bears come out. The boys get torn up. I don't know if they died. I don't know. But there's two things we can learn from this. Number one, uh, clearly, Alicia was bald and he didn't want to be made fun of about that. He, he wasn't having it that day. <laughs> OK, number two, Alicia had the power to not only heal and prophesy, but he had the power to punish. The point is this. When someone is operating in the spirit of Elijah, don't make them mad. That's a warrior spirit. You don't want to mess with someone who is operating in that type of anointing. Elijah, remember, Elijah called down fire from heaven to destroy 50 soldiers, and then he did it again. Elisha had bears come out of the woods. The spirit of Elijah anointing, it doesn't, it doesn't play. The question is, is there any indication that the anointing or spirit of Elijah can still cover people today? Well, let's look at what Malachi says. In Malachi chapter four, it says that before Jesus returns, or really before the Lord comes, Elijah would return. Look what it says, verse five. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And so this is why many people, even in Jesus's day, they knew about this verse. They knew that Elijah was supposed to come on earth again before Jesus was here. And so when they saw Jesus walking around, people would come up to him and say, you know, Jesus, you're here. So where's Elijah? We know Elijah, he's supposed to come before you, before the Lord shows up. So where's Elijah? We know, we see you, where's he? And look at what Jesus responded to them in Matthew 17, 12. He says, but I tell you, Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. And in the next verse, it says, then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Wow. Jesus told them, Elijah, he already came, he came but not physically, but spiritually through John the Baptist. <laughs> and this is why when John the Baptist was about to be born, look at what an angel said to his parents, Luke 1 17. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <laughs> okay, this, this is deep. And, and, and I gotta make this clear. I gotta make this clear. So, cause this kind of was talked about in one of the uh, two witnesses documentaries and people have then asked, okay, so was John the Baptist a reincarnation of Elijah? No, I don't think this is saying anything like that. This is talking about something else. You see, John the Baptist was a person just like Elisha who operated in the spirit of Elijah, in the anointing of Elijah. You see, even though Elijah went to heaven, when he dropped his coat, what happened? Elisha picked it up and then that same spirit, that same anointing that was on Elijah was transferred to Elisha. So just like how Elijah was still in heaven while Elisha had power, Elijah was still in heaven when John the Baptist had power because John the Baptist also, according to Luke 117 and Jesus, was operating in the same type of spirit and anointing, the same mantle of Elijah. Why? Why did, why did John the Baptist have to operate in that type of anointing? To fulfill prophecy. You see, when the Bible makes a statement, it has to be fulfilled and God will see to it that it is fulfilled. 
Because in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it clearly says that before the Lord comes, Elijah must come first. And so to satisfy that prophecy, the spirit of Elijah had to come. It had to rest upon a messenger to prepare people for the Lord. Now, John the Baptist operated in the spirit of Elijah for Jesus' first coming. But we know Jesus is coming again. And the great and dreadful day of the Lord is still to come. And so to satisfy that prophecy, we know that it is likely that the spirit of Elijah must come again. Because as the prophecy in Malachi says, whenever the Lord comes, the spirit of Elijah must first come to do what? Prepare the way. And this is why before Jesus returns for the final time, it says the two witnesses will do what? Stop the rain, cause fire to fall, create plagues. Why? To prepare people for the coming of the Lord. My friends, the spirit of Elijah is coming back. Some people say that um, perhaps Elijah himself will physically return and do all of these things as one of the witnesses. And hey, and if you share that view, great, you know, share more of your perspective in the comments. That's what we're doing. We, we learn from each other. Now, personally, I think you can gather from some of our previous content that I lean towards those theologians who believe that there's some symbolism there and that the spirit of Elijah can satisfy this. Because um, even if Elijah didn't physically come when Jesus was here the first time, his spirit was upon John the Baptist. And apparently that satisfied the prophecy enough for Jesus to say that Elijah was already here. So if that was the case, then I don't think it's too far fetched to say that it's likely that the spirit of Elijah, the anointing of Elijah can again come and rest upon the witnesses of God, which will still, I would say, satisfied the prophecy of Elijah coming before the Lord comes, the spirit, the anointing, the mantle of Elijah. John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah. And this is why, you know, just as it says that the witnesses will go to war with the Antichrist, it says the saints will war against the Antichrist. Just as the witnesses will have power, the prophet Daniel said the saints will have power to resist the Antichrist. And so it seems that the same type of power described as taking hold of the witnesses is the same type of power that will take hold of the saints in the end times. And if that is the case, then that means that some of you, if you happen to be here during the final days, some of you hearing this may operate in the power anointing of Prophet Elijah as it is described with the witnesses. Now, if you lean this way, okay, if you, if you kind of lean this way in your interpretation, I think it is important to say that no, no, not all believers would operate in this type of power. This is this is big. OK, this is huge. It is a huge thing to operate in the anointing of Elijah. You saw what type of things he was able to do. So not all believers would operate in that type of power. And I think the biggest evidence of that is how Revelation 11, 4 says that the two witnesses are the two lampstands. Many theologians speak on how the entire body of Christ is represented by seven lampstands. And we see that in Revelation chapter one through three. But here it says that the two witnesses, those operating in this type of anointing are only two lampstands. So again, I don't wanna spoil it here. Definitely, when you get a chance, watch the two witnesses movie part two, because we look at how, yes, there are seven lampstands mentioned in the book of Revelation 
and they are interpreted by the angel as being churches. But two out of those seven were not rebuked. Two out of those seven were commended by God. And you're gonna to wanna to see the documentary to see which two out of the seven churches will be empowered and how that relates to us today. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Go watch that documentary. That's a big thing there. So there is something else that must be said about the spirit of Elijah. And so when you look at the way the spirit of Elijah operated throughout the Bible, it seems to operate in a type of plague power for a three and a half year period. For instance, Elijah stopped the rain for three and a half years. First Kings 17, Luke 4, 25. But Elisha caused famine for seven years. Second Kings 8, 1. Why is that? If the spirit of Elijah does plague like activity for three and a half years, why is it that when Elisha got the spirit, he did it for seven years? Oh, man. Well, what did Elisha ask for? He asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And that's exactly what he got. <laughs> he got a double portion. And so if Elijah's spirit creates plagues for three and a half years and Elisha got a double portion of it, of, the, of that same anointing, we see why he was able to create a plague for seven years. 3.5 times two, seven, yeah. So you see, it, it gets deep. So if believers or the witnesses are going to operate in something similar as it seems to be described in the book of Revelation, would the witnesses have a single portion or a double portion of Elijah's anointing? Well, it seems that Christ and those who receive the spirit of Christ, which is really the Holy Spirit, it seems as if they are able to operate in a double portion of that type of anointing. And one reason for this is, if you look at Isaiah 61 verses one through seven, it describes how when the spirit of the Lord comes upon you, there is a double portion type of anointing that takes place, especially uh, around verses six and seven. Jesus himself quoted Isaiah 61 as he was reading from the scroll in the book of Luke. And he let the people there know that this was referring to him because he is the Lord and he had the spirit of the Lord. And so if someone has the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit within them, if they are given Elijah's anointing on top of that, most likely they would operate in a double portion of it like Elisha did. Which would mean that rather than just having three and a half years of power, they would be able to operate in seven years of power. Now that actually does make sense when you think about it, because how long would the two witnesses operate in power? Well, really, they're going to have power for seven years. The first half will be the period of the two witnesses prophesying about Christ for three and a half years. And then in the middle point, we know the Antichrist arises. And then for the last three and a half years, there's this battle between the witnesses and the Antichrist. So really, um, there's this seven year period of power with the witnesses. And so you could argue that the witnesses will be operating in a double portion of Elijah's anointing. I mean, you could definitely argue that. And I, I lean that way. And again, this is likely why it is said that if you look at the chronology of John the Baptist's ministry, scholars point out that it is likely that he was in the wilderness prophesying for guess how many years? Three and a half years. If he had the spirit of Elijah on him, there's a time period with that. He was prophesying for three and a half years. Um, for some reason, he didn't really, he wasn't known for doing plagues and all that sort of thing. Maybe because that just wasn't his assignment, right? But it still seems that he operated for three and a half years of prophesying. Did he have a double portion? I, I don't know. He was killed before he had a chance to really do much else. So 
I personally am not sure if he had a double portion of the anointing because he died before the Holy Spirit was something that you could be given. But for those who have the Holy Spirit, if they received Elijah's anointing, it seems that they would get a double portion of it. <laughs> okay, this is big. This is, this is just a lot of stuff here. But basically, I just wanted to show that Elijah's anointing even comes with a time period. Hey, more things for you to study and look into. And I hope you will continue to share your insights, share what God is revealing to you. Because really, we, you know, I look at the comments, we learn from each other. And some of you in the comments are so deep. Some of you are so scholarly in your study that you are sharing things that is really enriching all of our understanding. So continue to pray for God to give you insight, inspiration, revelation. And we can continue to have a conversation about these things because I know this is a lot of stuff, right? And so we got to have, we got to talk about all of this. Now, we know that the spirit of Elijah has the ability to create plagues, okay? And we know that the witnesses of God will create plagues. And there seems to be many links between the power that the witnesses will have and the power that the end time saints will have. In the recent documentary, we looked at how it is likely that the prayers of the saints will have something to do with the plagues that will come. You know, because we talked about how if there will be a portion of believers, a portion of saints who can operate like the witnesses, you know, it wouldn't be likely that one person could just create plagues, but it would be more likely that there would be prayer groups where people would be uh, working together to create these things. And so we looked at that in the documentary. And so we have to ask ourselves, is there anything in the book of Revelation that shows that the plagues that will come were created by the prayers of the saints? Well, let's read Revelation 8, 6. Now, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And so, you know, you can keep reading and you will see that as each angel blows a trumpet, some type of plague takes place. So what was it that caused the angels to do this? Well, when we scroll up to verse two, it tells us what happened right before the angels started blowing those trumpets and causing plagues. Look at how it reads. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And after that, then we see the angel started blowing those trumpets. My friends, the main ingredient that caused these things to happen was what? The prayers of the saints. You see, Prayers are powerful. When you get a group of believers praying about something, things happen. We got to understand the power of prayer. <laughs> the thing that caused the angels to even do this, to create these plagues, was the, the prayers of the saints. That was the key ingredient that was presented before God. We got to start praying, people. Because when you have enough people praying, it sends up an aroma to God that causes even angels to act. And so friends, get ready. Because just like Elisha picked up Elijah's coat and operated in his anointing, I believe many of you will do the same. 
God has that mantle, but I believe he is ready to clothe his people, his faithful followers, who are like the two lampstands in the coat of Elijah. The anointing of Elijah is making a return, and the prayers of the saints will do mighty things.